morning or afternoon or night. I don't know when you're watching this. Uh, I'm recording this in the morning. Uh, so this is community. So we are going to look at the last of our microsystems. So we've done the child in the middle. We've done family. We've done school. We've done peers. We've done media. And now we are doing community. So we're going to look at the parts of the community functions and community services. So um, just a couple of definitions, once again, so you know the starting area that I'm thinking of. So when I think of a community, I think of a group of people living in the same area, neighborhood or town or city or even street, um, and they typically follow common laws as well. There can be online communities, which I guess would be less of a geographic area, but maybe have some of the same interests are in the same area or do the same jobs. There's still some kind of commonality. It's also a group of people sharing fellowship or friendly association or common interests, like I said, for online. The word community comes from Latin, like many of our words, which means shared. So it's the concept of sharing either a job or space or attitudes, norms, values, beliefs, rules, obligations. So typically when we're thinking of a community that you might live in, it's a lot of people who live in kind of the same area, have the same laws, um, and maybe some of the same uh, norms or values or rules as well. Uh, so this is kind of the spatial aspect. This would be Southern California. Uh, so it can be small and nearby. So it could just be your neighborhood or your street, or it could be large and far reaching if you're talking about your county. Uh, maybe the state of California, or maybe your community is that we're all Americans, or we're all West Coast, or we're all part of the United States. Um, so this is just kind of Southern California. Uh, we've got all of the larger areas, um, and that we could be talking about Southern California as a community. And we have, you know, certain cultures and values uh, for people who, you know, live primarily by the coast um, in Southern California. Um, I wanted to, sorry, I wanted to click on some poverty level uh, in, uh, information uh, because a big part of community is our socioeconomic status and how much money we have and how much ability we have because of that money. With money typically comes more opportunities um, and it might, so, might also change how you're socialized as well. So these are some of the federal poverty level uh, classifications. So um, Alaska and Hawaii have their own, uh, but here in um, the United States or the 48 states, uh, the lower 48, as we like to say, um, you this is how much money you would need to make in order to not be considered at the poverty level. So if it was if it was just you, if you made $12,000, around $12,000, um, then you, under them that, then you would be in the federal poverty level. If there was a single parent and one child, you would make 16,000 uh, for a family of three. So maybe two parents and a child, 20,000 for four, a family of four. So two, usually two parents and two children, 25,000, five children, 29,000. Uh, so that's not very much money um, in order to kind of raise like three children, four children, five children. Uh, so it's not that much money. In California, we have different kind of standards as well. Many of them do. Um, and also for um, California, we are right here. Uh, so we are less than 15% of the poverty rate. Uh, um, Mississippi, Louisiana, and uh, New Mexico are closer to 20%, which means they have 5% more people living in poverty, according to that federal definition, which is pretty, pretty low. Um, this is for uh, California. Um, so we once again have a different um, kind of standard for uh, poverty and we also like to track it in the United States by population, so young people. So this one's for older people, uh, which I think is interesting because I mean, at least I consider children under the age of 18 or children and elders, which are people over the age of 65 to be our kind of most vulnerable population. So the number of people ages 65 and older living in poverty is actually starting to rise as well. Um, so about 500,000 are below the poverty line, so they're making less than 14,000 um, and a year, and uh, 1.48 million are living at 28,000 um, percent, 28,000 or less per year as well. 
here's North County cities. I have this and I found this because I live in Oceanside. Um, and I just thought this was an interesting graph because we're talking about the recession and many of you are probably too young or were quite young when the recession happened. But in 2008, we had, in 2007, we had kind of a recession which kind of slowed the economy very dramatically. This is poverty rates in 2007 versus poverty rates now. So you can see in all of the communities except San Marcos in the area which I live, um, the poverty rate increased, um, like for my area, um, it increased by um, double. Um, so the amount of people doubled because of the recession as well. So that's very common and that's not just where I live, that's all over Southern California and a lot of the United States as well is we've kind of, our communities got hit really hard. So why am I talking about poverty rates and all those um, types of ideas? Because the amount, the, the way that children live is how we are socialized. So children living in poverty who might have less opportunities um, are going to be affected and that's going to affect their socialization as well. So we know in many of the children that, we're, that we are giving care to now, they are now living post-recession, so after the recession, so there is more poverty now than there might have been when you were growing up or I was growing up as well. So here's some more information about children, poverty, and economic hardship going along with 2007, so pre-recession, and then 2015 post-recession. Um, so you can see that the numbers increased uh, by almost 10,000 just in San Diego County, once again, where I live. Um, and then children in economic hardship as well um, increased, but only about 5,000, which um, is about 2% as well. So this is just a this is just children in this area. So this has kind of changed our community, and it's going to change those children's socialization as well. So we have five functions of community. The first one is production, distribution, and consumption. So this is making goods sending goods out and buying goods. So uh, target uh, buying goods um, or buying them from producers, distributing them to all of the targets around the country, and then us people going to target and hitting the dollar spot more than they wanted to. Uh, we also have socialization, which is everything that we've kind of covered in this class so far. We also have social control. So how do we want you to be socialized? We do it by control, by group pressure, by punishment, by consequences by modeling. We want you to participate ideally, and we haven't really talked a lot about that, but we want you to participate in your community. We want you to be a vital part of your community as well. And we also need support from our community. So if things go bad, things go wrong, and we need help, we typically get that help from our community as Um, so, social control. So I already talked about um, production, uh, distribution, and consumption. So that is kind of how our communities all get together to make sure that we have enough food. Uh, wait, here we are, post-coronavirus. How do we get toilet paper? Um, somebody needs to produce it. Then somebody needs to put it on trucks. They need to distribute it. Then it needs to get to Costco. Then too many people are buying too much toilet paper. We don't have enough. Um, we need to get more. And then we have to put laws in place, social control in place, so that people can only buy certain amounts of toilet paper so that everybody has what they need because it was scary when it was happening and people were making irrational ch um, choices and buying things that they probably didn't need a lot of because they were, were scared and are probably still scared and anxious about it as well. So we have laws or we just have rules, like Costco has rules, and then we also have price gouging laws as well. So the Justice Department at the federal level and then the state attorney's office at the state level um, can uh, crack down and arrest people if they are price gouging in an emergency like this coronavirus. So if you were selling uh, toilet paper um, at a crazy increased price, so like $27 a roll, something like that, uh, they can and they will um, arrest you and you can be prosecuted. Uh, just a couple of days ago in Fallbrook where my husband grew up, they arrested like seven people for price gouging. Um, so that is the laws that we have for social control in order to keep our society and our community functioning and then also group pressure as well. So way back at the beginning of the class, I showed that funny elevator video about people standing on an elevator um, and that kind of group pressure that people might feel to look a certain way, talk a certain way, behave a certain way. Um, here's more about group pressure, and this is from uh, kind of a classic uh, 
psychology test that we, not I didn't do it, uh, it was way before I was born. It was in the uh, 1970s at Stanford up in Northern California. Um, and they uh, divided a bunch of men into groups and some were prisoners and some were prison guards. And they wanted to kind of see how group pressure uh, works uh, and they got more than they bargained for and that they had to shut down the experiment uh, within a few days because it got out of hand because of the group pressure that people were feeling. So I'm going to play a short clip from this. The experiment is not a public opinion poll. It examines behavior under the pressure of social forces as the experiment unfolds. Of solitary Solomon Ash reveals. The experiment you'll be taking part in today involves the perception of length of mind. As you can see here, I have Oh, and I'm sorry, this one actually is a different one. Uh, the Stanford one was prisoners, um, and there was a lot of, uh, they got a little violent, they got uh, very intense with the study, and they started to do, um, they started to be a bit violent and more than they should have, so they had to shut it down. Uh, but they saw there was a lot of group identity and group pressure in the people who were the in prison, and then the people who were also the jailers as well. Um, so I was talking about this one. This one is, um, is a little bit different. They're looking at different lines and you're seeing um, if people will speak out if they see uh, that something is wrong or not. And that's very common. We see that a lot. Maybe you experienced this just recently. Uh, maybe you were at the grocery store at the start of kind of coronavirus and you saw people over buying toilet paper. Um, and all of a sudden you felt like, what do they know that I don't know? Uh, what's going to happen? I'm scared. I'm nervous. And you went and you overbought some kind of food item or toilet paper as well. So group pressure has been very well documented. Usually we follow what the group does uh, because we have been conditioned and socialized to do so. Social participation. So ways that we can participate in our community. Our church is a really big one. Church, mosques, synagogues, any kind of religious institution. There's typically um, an amount of like tithing that you might give, an amount of money that you might give or just volunteering, doing Sunday school, or just showing up on Sundays or other days as well. Then we have neighborhood functions. Uh, so if your neighbor is having something, a clean up the beach day or a block party, sports clubs are huge as well. A local soccer team, they can be very, very close. You can play on that team for many years, or you can rotate um, and meet more people out of your community. A lot of times you'll have community groups. You might have new mothers groups, parenting groups, you might have uh, a local seniors groups as well. Social media like the Nextdoor app or uh, social media sites like Instagram will have hashtags for certain communities and areas as well. And then a lot of times people will write letters to the editors um, or they will post on social media about their community. Um, and unfortunately, a lot of times it's displeasure, but a lot of times it can be support as well. Mutual support. Um, so supporting, uh, this is when you are helping your community and supporting your community. A lot of times it can be with money. Uh, so a gun, a GoFundMe for a student athlete who gets hurt. So that would be an example of mutual support. So he broke his leg, his parents don't have 
enough money or somebody needs to stay home with him. Um, so the community rallies around him and people, uh, you know, give five, ten dollars um, and that helps that student out athlete who got hurt. Um, a lot of I saw this just recently, um, a student athlete got hurt. I mean, he's on a ventilator and he's in the hospital. And so our local pizza shop uh, did a fundraiser. So every piece sold on like a week um, of like this special pizza pie that they made for him that had sausage because he loved sausage or something like that. So they made a special sausage pizza. And for every slice or pizza that they um, sold, they gave like 50% to the family. So that would be an example of a restaurant in your community offering mutual support. Um, a community hospital gets supported with your tax dollars. So when you pay your taxes, it goes to local support. It goes to uh, roads, hopefully, a lot of our California money. And we had some discussion about this in the last couple of years about getting our roads fixed up. So we have a state tax that we pay into, but it pays for paramedics, firefighters, hospitals, um, but also community hospitals will also get donations um, or people will go to galas or they will buy auctions, things like that. So those are other those are typically monetary, but there are other ways that the community can support each other. A beach cleanup where you don't have to necessarily give money, but you go out and you make sure that your beach or your park is cleaned up. Um, maybe going to a pancake breakfast to support the local firefighters. Uh, maybe getting together and knitting booties or hats for babies who are in the NICU or are born premature. Um, all those ways might be things that you could do to support your community that necessarily aren't money related. All right, so this is your online activity this week. So um, I'm gonna play this clip, but it will also be on Canvas and you are going to watch this. And then on Canvas, you are going to list the types of community services that this teacher mentions in her video. So I'm gonna play this here, but it will also be on Canvas for you to watch it.
All right, so once again, this video will be on Canvas, so um, you can watch this again, and then on Canvas, you will list the types of community services uh, that she mentions in the video. Uh, so a community serves both the individual and the group. So if children um, are gonna grow up to be good members of adult society, which is why we have socialization, then they need positive role models and mentors and leaders, and they need to be part of that. Um, so the older children get, and especially in adolescence and in high school, they should experience in getting involved in their community, doing service learning like you guys did before we got shut down, um, having going to discussions, collaborating, maybe going to school board meetings, um, being involved in what's taught to them, maybe having some input on curriculum. All of that might be ways that we can support children being in the community. All right, I wanted to just skip back to the ecological system. I wanna make sure that we feel good about that. So ecological system um, could be our community and our peers. So do we have places for you and your friends to hang out, a beach, good transportation, like on buses, safe parks that you can go to, youth leagues, after school programs, safe places just generally for children to hang out with their friends. Uh, what about a community and families? If a family is struggling or in poverty, what might resources might the community have? Uh, so in that video that we just showed, um, the, the uh, nurse had community donations, which she was able to support families with. Um, and then community and media. How does your community use media? So are you able to get information from your community? So if something happened in the school board, or something happened at the city council level, or uh, it, with the police, how are they gonna notify you? More and more uh, communities are starting to use media um, and not just do it on radio or in the newspaper, but also use social media and email as a way to connect with you and to make sure you know what's going on. So where's the local uh, Easter egg hunt this year? Uh, coffee with a cop. Uh, meet your firefighter. All of those are community events that we want people to use and we're getting better at using email and social media to, to collaborate those. So once again, our MESO system is links, connections, or relationships between parts of our microsystem. So what about our exosystem? And this is where a lot of our community is. So this would be our school system, our school board, the parent's job, um, uh, health services, community services, child protective services, child welfare services, your pediatrician, anything like that. So your exosystem definitely affects and is a big part of your community. So that community that you have surrounding you as a person, you're definitely going to get exosystem support. So um, however the city council can fund local parks, that's definitely going to affect your community, right? how much the school board can have transportation um, or opportunities for children in school that's also going to support your community. And then finally our macro system, so this is where you, where you live, how much money there is, so the poverty level and how many people living in poverty is going to affect your community and your neighborhood, society's ideas, beliefs, and attitudes and values about poverty, about community. Is community important to this society? Do you think that people should hang out a lot? Um, or is this society more closed off? That, or you spend more time with your family and maybe less with your friends. Same with politics. What are your local politicians spending the money on? More community related um, or maybe on infrastructure like roads or maybe on hospitals. What are they spending their money on? That's definitely gonna affect your community too. All right, that is it for my short little lecture on community, which is the last of the microsystems that we're gonna be learning about. We're gonna change gears and we're gonna look at the other parts of our system for the rest of our class lectures. Otherwise, I will see you guys online.